Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. For our next presentation, we have Mr. Diego Dominguez. Diego is currently a network delivery manager at Facebook, where he manages capacity and caching plans for edge traffic in Latin America. He studied electronics engineering at the University of Buenos Aires. And before joining Facebook, he worked for internet service providers, as well as global carriers in Argentina, Spain, and the United States. Diego will be presenting on CDNs, Facebook Edge, serving traffic effectively to people, and will provide an overview on how Facebook infrastructure works and how it has evolved over the years. As a reminder, if you have questions about the contents of the presentation, please write them in the Q&A box and we will answer them. Welcome, Diego. The virtual floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, you hear me okay? Everything all right? Oh, yes, sorry. we can hear you. Yeah, yeah, perfect. Thank you. All right. Uh, I see the presentation now, right? <clears throat> yes. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you for the introduction. Um, today, the presentation uh, was prepared by my colleague, Taria Mares, who hasn't been able to join us today but she's here in the spirit and, and in the content in the slides. I myself, uh, like Kevin said, my name is Diego Dominguez. My pronouns are he, him, his. I've been at Facebook for four years and I work with our, um, the execution of our strategy in, for, for uh, caching, and, caching and peering in Latin America. So let's dive in. The, um, as you know, our infrastructure, Sorry, as, as you know, Facebook has multiple apps and our infrastructure supports all of them. That's the Facebook app on your phones, the Instagram app, Messenger, and WhatsApp as well. And the main challenge that we face is the scale of what we have to do and support with that infrastructure globally. For example, uh, as of last year, we had over 3.3 billion users globally uh, that use our apps at least one time a month. Uh, and, uh, you know, people do a lot of things with the apps. They upload pictures constantly on medias as well. And they post comments, status updates, likes, and they interact with each other constantly. So that creates a massive challenge for, for the infrastructure and for how our network operates. And in this presentation, I'd like to address two um, typical questions that come up regarding our CDN and how we run our network. One is, if you guys have caches and peering, what's the difference of whether I have one, a connection to either of those? And, and then some common issues that may happen if you are trying to troubleshoot something that's going on in your network, and you see that your trace route is not going exactly in the direction or in, in the path that you were expecting it, trying to understand what's going on there. So I'm going to be talking first of all how we serve traffic from the edge. So basically how the CDN um, delivers content from the closest point. And a very important thing to, to keep in mind is that each CDN is built with a different purpose uh, by a different company and to serve different type of users and content. So the way the Facebook CDN works, it's not the same as um, other CDNs. They're very similar, but they're not quite the same. So first I'm gonna talk about what do we mean by the edge of Facebook network. So first I'm focusing on the, the Americas region and sorry, sorry, Canada, but you know, I had to make the, this a little bit shorter and focus on the area that we're talking about today. We have a bunch of data centers that are built and operated by Facebook uh, in the United States and Europe, obviously for, uh, for Central America and South America, those are the closest, those in the US are the closest, they're huge. And that's where everything is stored. So that's the, the videos, the photographs, and all the content is stored in the data centers only. But the users actually don't connect to the data centers. And instead, we have POPs on the presence that are part of our edge network. And those POPs are exactly where, where the Facebook network ends and the rest of the internet begins from our point of view. So in these POPs, we have, we have a few racks of servers and they act as kind of like big caches. They cache local content that is relevant to the region that the pop serves. 
At the moment we have 11, the closest to the least is in, in Guatemala. And we also have connections um, to, to most of Central America and the Caribbean from Miami as well. Uh, and then the next level of the edge is what we call the FNA program with the, with the caches. We send caches that are um, the, big, the, the largest could be one rack. Um, and the smallest can consist of two servers with that, that occupies four rack, four rack units. And those are almost everywhere at this moment uh, inside of the internet service providers network. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about how the Facebook Edge, uh, be it through the pops or through the caches, how we connect to the, um, to, the, to the networks and how we deliver traffic to users. But this is what we mean by Edge, is where the Facebook network ends and when we connect to the users. I also want to mention that we have two types of content basically, which are first what we call dynamic, and dynamic content is, is not cacheable for us. This is basically messages, likes, the new seed uh, framework and the call signaling. This traffic, the dynamic will only be served from our pops. And the static content, this can be cached, can be served from the pops and from the caches as well. And it consists basically of images, videos and live streaming. And it represents about 95% of our traffic to end users. So the caching solution, it's focused on, on this content and it makes sense because it represents, like I said, the vast majority of our traffic it can then um, make things easier for internet service providers as well. So what, what does it mean uh, getting content closer to user and, and how does this look from a performance perspective? So if you have users, for example, in South America, this, this is just for the sake of uh, making the diagram a little bit easier to, to present and the issue to be understood. Uh, we usually serve content from the, from the closest point, which could be, for example, a pop in Brazil or a pop in Argentina with the lowest latency possible compared to other options, for example, in the US. But if one of those pops were to fail to be disconnected, and this applies also to a cache as well, uh, we would serve, serve content from the next closest point, which might be farther away. And in that case, latency will suffer. This is what this diagram shows on the X horizon is time and the, the vertical is the Y it's um, latency on average. So that big change that, you, that we see there, it's for example, when a pop goes down or a cat goes down, uh, that the latency spikes because this could be for example, under 50, um, milliseconds could be the case for, for a network that's connected. The users are close to a pop in, let's say, Argentina, Chile, that goes down and then it turns, um, the traffic falls back to, to Miami, for example. And if you look at this, if you reverse the timeline, you could think that this is also the reason why we create pops, why we bring caches, because it will have a massive impact in reducing latency. Okay, with that in mind, this is, this is what I want to achieve, right? Uh, uh, having minimum latency. So how do we control this traffic and we make it do what we want? Well, the most important things for us is obviously performance and to achieve performance, we measure uh, closeness. How close is each one of our uh, points of presence to the users? We have a tool called Sonar. Basically operates like a Sonar. It, will, it, it, it operates by from the Facebook Blue app installing the user phones, uh, it sends sub thumbnail requests. That's uh, a request for a very small image, a very few kilobytes to be sent from multiple pops. So in that way, we can measure the latency from each one of the points of presence that can see the IP to that user. And this will allow us to measure latency from each one of the possible points from which we can deliver traffic to that IP address. And we have uh, a global controller architecture. We actually have two controllers, global and local. We're gonna focus on the global controller first. Our global controller receives information um, that doesn't just come from BGP. We also consider capacity in the links and what's, what are the utilization levels of the links that, are, you know, that go to a network. Uh, we consider the latency, routing information that does come from, that does come from BGP and health. And with all this information, we build uh, a map. In this case, a DNS map. 
that will associate to each um, DNS server the closest point of presence. So that for, for example, a DNS server um, located in, in, in Hong Kong, uh, we will associate uh, a resolution to facebook.com that is from an IP address from our pop in Hong Kong. Whereas for uh, a DNS server located in Belize, uh, we probably will associate the resolution of facebook.com to an IP address from our pop in Miami or, or the next closest point. That's basically the purpose of having a map. And we don't only have that the first resolution, since we have uh, that measure of the latency from each possible point of presence uh, where we see that address, we actually have um, like a table where we know which is the best location to serve uh, traffic, the second best, third best, etc. So that if that the, the, the best location happens to fail or be unavailable, we can easily fall back to the next best location to serve that user. And, but this operates, uh, like we call this uh, like peering islands. So the global controller would determine which is the best island from our point of view. So the island could be a metro, for example, in, in New York, we have multiple pubs. Um, oh, sorry, that was, that was too fast. Uh, in New York, we have multiple pubs. In, in Frankfurt or London, we also have multiple points of presence. So the global controller only determines which is the closest island. Uh, but then we need to rely on a second controller, which is the one we call local. I'm gonna talk a little bit more about that one in a minute to determine which one is the best router, which one is the best interface uh, inside of that island. Um, and this, this is also relevant because uh, even if we can assign which is the best island, so for example, oh yeah, this user is closer to New York, let's use our New York Metro to deliver traffic. Um, and then the normal, the, the, the thing you would expect is that we would rely on BGP. So which is the shortest prefix, which is the, uh, the IES path length. But actually BGP does not tell us much about performance, which is what we care about, performance and user experience. So we have a local controller that will be looking at this, um, at this uh, metrics and will manage capacity per link level inside of a pub or inside of a metro. So the global controller will assign the best island, the best metro, and then inside of there, the local controller takes charge and will find the best link to deliver traffic to each, um, to each IP prefix specifically. Uh, the, one of the most important things that, that the local controller will do also is um, keep track of utilization levels. So that when we see that a, a, an interface goes above 90%, that means that it looks like it's gonna be congested very soon, we take measures. We want to prevent that interface to um, start dropping packets, which will then affect uh, user experience. Uh, so what we do, we uh, determine which is the best next uh, alternative route and we'll inject artificial BGP routes um, to the alternative path. So for example, if we see a prefix through a direct peering and also through an indirect, um, let's say like a transit provider or another peer that has a longer AS path, um, for example, if this is a, an issue with an slash 24, then we break it down in two slash 25s, for example, and, and we then distribute traffic across these two artificial routes. Uh, visually, it looks like this. We have a premium router that has a connection with a peer that somehow is um, it's congested. It's above 90% utilization. The local controller identifies this um, because it collects uh, metrics of different sorts and it takes an action. It determines which is an alternative path to decongest or to reduce traffic in the congested link so that we uh, are able to have what we call happy links that don't have packet drops. But you know, this is what our CDN does and how we distribute traffic, but we cannot just run the internet by ourselves, obviously. <laughs> And we need to figure out the best path or the best way to work together. And we have different methods of egress that we work with, with partners around the globe, in particular in Latin America and Caribbean, uh, for myself. One is caching. Caching, caches are deployed for networks that qualify. We have different criteria for different regions. Um, you can find more information about it by reaching out to our fna at fb.com email account. 
the cache is like we said, we'll offload images needed on live streaming. So that's only the, the, what we call the static content. And it has one great advantage that we can deploy multiple caches inside of large networks. This allows us to have resilient topologies, whereas for us, it's very difficult to have more than one pop in certain areas. For example, in Latin America, Caribbean, um, the only place where we have more than one pop in one metro is Sao Paulo in Brazil. The, um, the next um, method of rigorous we have is peering to be through an IX uh, with public peering or with dedicated ports uh, with PNI using 10 gig or 100 gig ports. Either way, you need to have a peering DB record for, a, for your ASN or your details. For example, for peering um, at an IX, we require that you are list the peering, the IX at which you are present and your IP address is there as well. And regional peering is the next level of redundancy. So perhaps this, this, this not, wouldn't be easy in the least. Obviously, if you don't have a point of presence there, like I said, the closest is Guatemala. But for example, for networks that, that are able to connect in Guatemala, we, we offer the possibility of having a backup connection in Miami as well, or, or any other location where we could have a second um, connection to a Facebook metric to have redundancy. Always when you have multiple connections to, to Facebook, uh, latency will, will be measured and we will deliver traffic from the closest location to the user based on latency, as long as there is capacity. Like I said before, if we detect capacity constraints, then we move traffic away from that location to the next next. And finally, our last resort is transit. That is an indirect route uh, that we know have costs. And the other big issue that transit has from our point of view is that since it's not a direct connection between Facebook and the user, the network has a user, we don't really know um, how much capacity there is there. So we cannot actually quite measure if there is overload of the transit provider's network or their connections to, um, to, the, final, to the final network other than the connections they have with ourselves. So with that, with all that content already explained, I want to go back to the questions that I put forward at the beginning and see if, make sure that I have addressed those. What's the difference between caches and peering? Well, we had two different types of content and caches, the FNAs can only serve um, static images, videos, and live streaming, though that represents 95% of the concept. Peering can serve everything, both static and dynamic, but it would also serve the cache field. This is really important. So the, the content in the cache does not come from the users. Uh, when a user uploads a picture, that goes to the pop and from there to the data center, which is stored. The content in the cache comes from the Facebook pop. So we need to have, um, we need to be able to reach the cache inside of the ISP network from our pops through the internet or through a direct connection. So peering is very important and our pubs are super important because they will provide that cash flow traffic. And obviously uh, peering can always be a redundancy for caches or an overflow for when a cache is full. And the other question was, why, why do I may do a trace route and see traffic doing weird things, things going through a weird route? It could be the global controller reacting to some change um, in network topology and capacity constraints, or seeing that something is not working quite as expected. So it's not just BGP that we take into account, it's very important. Uh, taking measures to, to address performance issues. So for example, when we see, we constantly monitor connectivity to caches from the internet. And if we detect that a certain prefix cannot be reached um, with good uh, availability levels, so imagine sending multiple things and the, the, the result is not 100%, then we determine that that cache, for example, is not connected quite well to the internet. And to prevent uh, issues with the users, we may drain that cache. And again, um, different type of content, right? So um, maybe a ping will not go to the cache because the ping is not, um, it's, not a, it's not a static content. And finally, um, I would like to mention um, some best practices for peering. Uh, for peering at an IEX, uh, we want to address that we believe IEXs, IEXPs are very important for 
developing local peering ecosystems for keeping local content local. Um, they should be structured in a way that help networks save money and um, improve latency for, for users. How do we evaluate uh, connecting from Facebook to NIX? Well, we look at the networks that are connected there, if they have enough capacity in their connections to the IX to absorb Facebook traffic, uh, whether it's easy for networks to become members or it's, there are some IXPs that make it like really difficult for smaller providers to become members just because they have certain requirements, how much has to be paid or what kind of requirements are for the size of the, of the members. Uh, we really look at where those are located. It's not the same if they are located in a carrier neutral place or, or if it's located at a facility that relies on one provider and that can limit growth over time. Um, we also look at the membership structure and other things as well. And some best practices since we're here, uh, we all do peer, we hope you all do peer. Uh, we want to remind you to keep an updated peering degree profile, to set prefix limits, to communicate that clearly with your peers, whether that be Facebook or someone else, to check your advertisement policies. We always advise that you advertise more specific prefixes to your peering that are your transit or at least the same um, size prefix, but not advertising more specific to transit. Make sure your advertisements are consistent when you have multiple connections to the same ASN. Be aware of prefix limits and do not advertise private uh, IP or restricted IP address space. It's a good practice to use BGP communities to identify routes, in particular at Facebook. Um, for uh, traffic engineering, we, uh, we use BGP community tagging instead of rely. We, have, we uh, advise uh, our peers to use that policy instead of using uh, prepends um, and all the alternatives. And by the way, we do not support MET. If you use MET in a connection with Facebook, it will be ignored. That said, that's all I have for you. Um, I hope you enjoy the presentation. I'm here for your questions. Thank you very much, Diego. For our question and answer segment, I'll defer now to Mr. Carlos Martinez, who will lead us through. Carlos. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Diego, for, for a very interesting and informative presentation. Uh, I'll be taking your questions through the Q&A tool that you can uh, use uh, on the lower part of your Zoom window. Um, before we, um, before people, our attendees have uh, the time to think out their questions and use the Q&A, I have one that uh, was sent to me uh, via chat. And it has to do, Diego, with, uh, with IPv6. How does IPv6 uh, play into this strategy of uh, content delivery? Uh, we know that I, Facebook has actually been one of uh, a very vocal proponent of IPv6. And um, we would like to hear that from you, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, well, you know, our infrastructure is built from the ground up um, with. Uh, being IPv6 native. So for example, Aura data centers that have millions of servers uh, and a huge network, it's all run on IPv6. We only use, well, we mainly use IPv4 when, when we connect to the rest of the world, but internally we run everything nat natively in IPv6. So for example, our caches, um, our peering, by the way, when we set up peering, um, See if it's a PNI, like a direct connection. We are we make up, uh, connections both on IPv4 and IPv6, and IPv6 is mandatory. We do not. If you don't want to set up IPv6, then we're not having a PNI. We're trying to restrict with that, um, so that we encourage partners to set it up. It's not that complicated to set up. To set up, even if you don't have traffic, just set it up. And our caches, if they see a user. Uh, with IPv6 and IPv4, it will route traffic over IPv6 as a preference. We will always prefer IPv6 first. So we, this has been done to encourage the deployment also because IPv6, it's the solution that supports our network at the scale that, that, that it, it is today and it is growing. And our network and, and the operation of traffic, right? Connection to the users. 
as well. Um, you know, I have to say that we we haven't been supporting um, private IPv4 space and staging at bypass on our caches. Um, we had a massive discussion internally. Well, not a discussion, but you know, exchange of opinions about whether we would do that or not. Uh, the advantage of doing it is we enable our caching program to get closer to users if for networks that have CGNAT um, carry grade night yeah, deployed, if we're able to support the bypass and, and, and receive private IP address space and we're able to get closer to the users, right? And help partners save some money. But we, we decided not to support it as a way to, again, encourage moving away from CGNAT solutions into the use of IPv6. But uh, still the network, we started this program like five years ago and still, you know, we still have that same challenge. So we are starting to support carrier grade NAT on caches uh, very soon, like uh, the end of, let's say next month, probably. We are already doing it uh, as a test with some partners. Uh, we would have loved for the, for the world to catch up with IPv6 deployment globally, but it hasn't quite at the scale that we would like it to be. That's why we, we are, supporting this as well. But ideally we would love everything to be just IPv6 only. It would make things easier for us. Right, yeah, definitely. Um, do you do you translate IPv4 into IPv6 at the edge of the data centers? Um, can you comment on what technologies do you use, do you use for that? No, you know, at the edge, it's um, for the Facebook that we're in. So just, that's the, the bobs and the FNAs. So and we do not, um, we do not translate them one to, to bring them inside of our, our network. Uh, we will just uh, continue using IPv6 if it gives the traffic to the use is IPv6 or IPv4 if it's IPv4. What we will do is the, the, the whatever communication there is that is uh, exclusively internal between our POP and the data center, that will be IPv6. Nice. Right. Remember that the users never talk to the data centers. The users only connect to the pods or the caches, and then the pod will connect to the data center. So there's no direct connection for, for security reasons, mainly between users and, and data centers. That's excellent, thank you. I have a question from uh, um, one of our panelists actually, and since he cannot use uh, the Q&A tool, um, uh, I will give him the mic. So, Etienne, if you can unmute yourself and uh, send us your question. Thanks, Carlos. Uh, Diego, thanks very much for the presentation. Uh, two quick questions. Okay. Will the presentation be available to download um, and share? That's one. And the second one is, what is Facebook's policy? Um, and I'm, I, have my, I have two hats on right now. I've got a regulator hat and I've got an IX hat. Um, I am, uh, I'm not sure if you caught in the beginning. I'm actually... Um, part of the, the, the regulator in Belize as well. Um, but sh when, not if, when um, the IX in Belize approaches Facebook to, to get a cache into the IX, what is the policy with regard to traffic when there are already, we, we know there are already players and ISPs in Belize that are part of the IX, but have also already have their Facebook caches. How, how do how, what's, what's Facebook's policy regarding network versus, versus IX? Okay, um, thanks for the question at the end. Nice, nice to see you again, by the way. Um, sad that we can all meet in person and just catch up, but uh, you know, in a general meeting. But um, those are good questions. I, um, let me see if I got them right. One is uh, the policy for, for traffic from a cache that's inside of a network or through the IX. And what was the first part again? Was oh, sorry, that? yeah, yeah. The, the, the first part was, that, that, that's the main guts of the question. The other one was just if the, if the um, presentation would be made available for us. Oh, to... thank you, yeah, sorry. No, the presentation would, would not be available, would not allow okay. by our communication no team. I think it's mainly because the, the data in there, the numbers mainly um, could be updated, out of date after a few months. And those are very relevant numbers that are looked at when we, when the company does um, public presentations with regards to the stock exchange and all that stuff. So they don't want out, out of date numbers being, you know, around being confusing people or confusing investors. Okay, understood. So that's why we, we cannot make uh, presentations available. And then the, um, the second one, um, look, it, the way our, 
our um, network policy is implemented. First, like I said, we will look at latency. Um, so probably, but I, by the way, I cannot say whether a network has or doesn't have a, a cache just because of the of the NDA we signed when when it's a part of a, a, a partner. Yeah, and it's okay. Right? So, it's okay. Be I know, I know. Is small. We know everybody who, who has one. I know. I know exactly what you mean, right? So this is also being recorded. I have to say it. Uh, I cannot say, but I know. How, I know. I know how the world how the world works. Uh, that's fine. Um, but you know. Uh, so, for example, if if um, one thing that we look at is, is that exactly that before deciding to um, to deploy a cache inside of uh, an IEX. So, if if every member of the IEX already has their own cache, it doesn't make sense uh, for us to deploy a cache of the IEX. Usually, usually, it will depend on on the on the size, right? Probably in Belize that will be the case because of the size of the country it doesn't make the, the latency. Uh, change that much from location to location, but this could be different if it were, you know, a very large um, surface. Uh, but basically, if there were a cache inside of the IEX at the same time that a, a, a cache is inside of the ISP network, the first thing is whether the AES path has the same length, uh, which usually if we have bilateral sessions or we are using the route server will be the case. Uh, but we do prefer direct connections over um, non-direct. Well, what I mean by this, sorry, private versus non-private. Uh, so PNI, we prefer PNI connections over uh, public peering connections, and we prefer a local or inside of the ISP cache over um, a public cache, as we would call it. Why? The main reason is because when we have a direct connection, we have total control and knowledge of what capacity there is between the networks uh, because whatever I have a tanky port then we have a tanky port but with the with the ASN the final ASN if we are going through the IEX then we know we have one or two however many ports with the IEX but we don't know what's the capacity um, with them we may know through PNDB but we don't know how much um, room there is in that connection with the IEX for more traffic right we know that maybe it has uh, one gig of Facebook traffic is because we're sending it, but we don't know if that port is a 90% utilization on the ISP side or not. That's the main reason why. Um, that, that same reason if you extrapolate it globally, just because of the scale of our network, we try to keep things simple so that we can run operations as simple and smoothly as possible. Uh, but that, that's the main reason why uh, we will always prefer the private connection of our cache over an IEX. So, and then that's why we'll really look at the members of the IEX before deciding to put um, a cache there. Okay, Diego, that was very informative. I have one last question and then I have sadly to close the Q&A. And um, Stacy Mendoza asks, uh, who should uh, they approach when they want to actually ask Facebook for a local cache? Who is the contact in the region? Yeah, mm -hmm. there you go. FNA at FB.com. Right there Sorry? on the screen. Uh, yeah, can a, you repeat that? Oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know if you can see it, but it's the second one. So if That's, you have questions. Ah, okay, FNA, FNA at FB.com, right? Yeah, you have questions to set up okay. peering, reach out to peering at. About caches, FNA at, and if you have issues, any kind of issues, then the Facebook connectivity is not working quite right. Even if you don't have a connection with Facebook, but your users are having issues, reach out to knock at FB.com. Um, and then depending on the issue or depending on the request, those those questions may be routed to myself or to my colleagues Ali, or to different per people of our team, um, depending on you know, what's going on and what we need to do. That makes sense. So uh, thank you very much, Dio. That was very, very interesting and informative. Thank you, Etienne. And thank you everybody for watching us. I leave you with our great Kevin Swift, our master of ceremonies. <laughs> Thank you very much, Carlos, and thank you, Diego, for a very, very engaging presentation. At this point, we'll have a six-minute break, and we'll resume at 10.35 with a presentation on IPv6 for decision-makers. <laughs>